reducing flooding in this area, either to reduce flooding of, of homes here behind the levee, or even maybe by creating floodplain in here, of reducing flooding up in, up in this area. And what we found is none of those scenarios really reduce flooding very much. In fact, some of them actually increase the flooding. If it, some, some of them resulted in water slowing down enough because we created some floodplain and that water surface elevations actually go up, which sometimes you find to be the case uh, with this hydraulic modeling. Um, one thing that's important to know, uh, when we run the FEMA model, uh, it almost acts as if that levee's not there, uh, which is FEMA's policy when they model flood control levees. The FEMA, the, the, the levee has to be certified by FEMA. Uh, it has to meet FEMA's criteria in order for them to <coughs> use it in the model and treat it as if it's going to protect people from flooding. If it's going to get overtopped in the 100-year flood or if it has water that leaks through it or if it's going to blow out, they don't want to map it as a flood control levee. So that's the case here. So when the, the flood insurance rate maps that you see, the, the, the flood mapping for the town acts as if that levee doesn't exist. It's important to understand that. In order to, for, the, for it to be modeled, that levee would be, have to be brought up to, let, to FEMA's standards. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little more as when I get into the recommendations at the end. So the long story short here is that all those different iterations we tried didn't really reduce flooding in that area. So we have to look at other alternatives. It'd also be quite expensive. These are some of the different cross sections we looked at. I won't go into detail here, but you can see in some cases there wasn't a lot of change. In some cases, we actually caused an increase in water surface elevations through that area. So what we want to recommend in this area, number one, is armoring of that levee. Uh, you know, we were told that it breached in a certain area after Irene, and that in, in Tropical Storm Lee, which came shortly afterwards, it, it, it came very close to flooding through that same area. It was repaired, but it, if you, we do our field walks out there, you can see where it's eroding in certain areas, right where the water was directed at it. Uh, that area can be hardened. Uh, it won't really reduce flooding, but it will protect the levee and, and help prevent it from breaching in the future. Uh, we, I, I listed some factors there of why we aren't recommending that the existing levee be enhanced. Uh, one thing is that you cannot build up earth or a structure within the floodway because what will happen is you're going to cause flooding somewhere else. You're going to cause water surface elevations to go up somewhere else. So if the levee were to be reconstructed or enhanced, it'd have to be moved back from its current location so that it doesn't cause flooding elsewhere. It's called a setback levee. It would have to be moved <coughs> out of the floodway. So essentially you'd be talking about a brand new levee there. And there's a number of requirements in order, as I said, in order for it to meet the uh, the uh, FEMA requirement is a certified levy. Uh, it has to be able to withstand a 100-year flood and have three feet of freeboard, which would be quite a structure. And in order to be structurally sound, you know, it has to be high, and then it has to have an adequate base width. So by the time you designed and built this thing, not only would it be very, be very expensive, you'd probably, in order to make room for it, have to remove many of those homes that are being protected by the current levy. Uh, there's also always with a levee the potential that it's still going to fail or overtop, even if it's built to withstand the 100-year flood. And I use Wyndham as an example because Wyndham was kind of the epicenter of Tropical Storm Irene, and they had floods there that exceeded the 500-year flood event. And they had flood control uh, reservoirs up there that, that were designed for the 100-year flood. And they operated as they des were designed, but they were designed for the 100-year flood, so they started to spill. Uh, and that, that's all, you know, there's always a design limit when you design something. So there's always the chance we'll get hit with a flood that exceeds the design of something you build. They need to be built with an impervious core. Uh, you know, so when the level in the creek goes up, you don't have just the level on the other side going up. And I know that's not the case with the existing levee. I was told as the water in the creek goes up and down, so did the water in, in people's basements who lived on the other side of the levee. 
would also be extremely costly. Uh, and, and finding a funding source would be very unlikely. And those are the reasons why we didn't recommend that application. So the best scenario uh, for people who live in that area behind the levee is flood proofing. And, and flood, flood proofing consists of a lot of things. Uh, it could be anchoring utilities. It could be raising your appliances up uh, so they don't get flooded or your electrical panels. It could be elevations of structures, and I'll talk about that a little more. And it could be relocations. So we also looked at another area where Route 28 had actually washed out in Irene, and that's in the area of the, of the portal where the flows come in from uh, uh, Schoharie Reservoir. And that channel also, similar to this area near the confluence, uh, changed quite a bit in Irene, or following Irene. So this is, uh, you know, we, this was a little bit of forensics. We went back into here, looked at aerial photographs, and talked to people about what happened here. So this is pre-Irene. You can see here's the portal coming in from Schoharie Reservoir. And the flow is split here. Most of the channel goes this way. It's kind of an island. And there's a, a secondary channel coming through here. You can see in this photo there's water in it. And then post-Irene, and I don't know the full story, but apparently there was a decision made to block off this side channel after Irene. Uh, so water, although you still see some water in the channel here, flows aren't able to come through here. So we went out and measured this, and essentially we modeled both conditions. We wanted to see whether by blocking off this channel, we're, in, we're increasing flows and increasing flooding through this area, which maybe contributed to the washout of the road embankment and may contribute to flooding. So we compared both of those situations and basically uh, took the model and, and were able to compare both, uh, looking at not only flows, but maybe reducing flow velocities through here. But what we found was because of that, that blockage, once flows got up into the bigger floods, water was basically overtopping that structure anyways. So we didn't, in, in the area of the portal, let me go back for a second. Our, our, that's this cross section right here near the portal where we were trying to reduce the velocities. What you see here is, this, this shows the change in water surface elevation. There isn't really any change when you compare whether the blockage is there or not. There's some reduction in velocities. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, pre versus post Irene. So it's, 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 uh, if you see a number here, that means the velocities were lower with the, with the double channel before Irene. So you do see some increasing velocities here, but it's not a huge amount. Uh, Depending on where, which of those cross sections you looked at, there were some areas where there was some reduction in water surface elevations under the two-year flow, the five-year flow. But once you got to these bigger floods, that blockage was overtopping. So it didn't make any difference at that point. Water was flowing through that whole area. So there may be some potential by opening that secondary channel up to reduce velocities through there, maybe prevent that roadway from washing out in a future flood similar to Irene. But really, with our, our flood analysis, we weren't able to tease that apart enough, and it really would require a more detailed hydraulic analysis with more survey in that area. It is probably worth looking into a bit further, but we didn't find any big reductions in flooding by un unplugging that, that side channel. Then we started looking at uh, a number of alternatives for individual structures. And for this, we use the benefit cost analysis. And uh, what this entails, really, what we look at is the, the different projected flood elevations and how that compares to the, the first floors of, of flood prone homes. So, and then we look at that home were to be elevated or moved to it, you know, taken a buyout and moved the, the, the residents moved to another location. What would the benefits be from avoided damages? If you're getting flooded in a 10-year flood on a regular basis, your benefits of relocating are going to be greater than if you're only getting flooded in a 100-year flood. And rather than present information on each house, we sort of broke it into these categories. So if you're, you know, if there's, I'll show some maps. And we've got copies of them here. I'll go through them, and, but, but not in a lot of detail. If you see the red dot on the map, it means you're 
the benefits are greater than the cost of, of, of relocating. So that means you're probably, based on your first floor elevation, uh, your, your risk of flooding is high. And then as you go down the scale, once you get down to the bottom here, less than 0.25, it means you're less frequently flooded uh, and the benefit cost ratio is lower. Uh, and the elevations that we used, in some cases they were surveyed. We sent our surveyors out to collect first floor elevations uh, for some of the homes, and then others we were able to estimate first floor elevations uh, based on the elevation mapping that's been done. So we see these maps, and I know they're hard to see. Uh, <coughs> we've got some we can spread out later if you're interested in a particular home. Uh, but there are different colored dots on here. This is Bushmillsville Creek. Uh, and there's a range of different scenarios for each homes. Uh, you know, there's some green dots in this area, which means they're in the 0.5 range. There's some orange dots here, which means they're less than 0.25. This is the area right at Broad Street Hollow, where it comes into Asopus Creek. So you can see some, some of the different colored dots on there. And that's going a little further up Broad Street Hollow. This is a Sopus Creek above Shandaken. So you can see there's a number of homes on the left here that are not very frequently flooded, even though they're in that 100 year floodplain. You get into the area near Shandaken, there's a mixture. You can see a blue one there. Uh, and then this is close to Fox Hollow, where I talked about the bridge, the water flanking the bridge on this side. And I know I'm going through these kind of kind of fast, but you could take a closer look at these later. Uh, this is the town hall and a couple of structures downstream of the town hall, which uh, based on the red dots are quite flood prone. Now we looked at the, the town hall in a, in, a, in a different way, the town hall complex, because uh, we wanted to take a closer look at this town hall. Um, we call it the town hall complex, and it consists of the, the highway garage here, which is on one town-owned parcel. Uh, and then there's a total of four parcels, which are owned by the town. This one contains the highway garage. This one contains the, the town hall. We're standing right here, right now. And then we have the dog pound back here. Uh, and a lot of equipment stored out here from the highway garage. So here we're able to calculate the benefits. If this structure were to be taken out of here, and it, it, there were no flood damages, going forward in time for the next 50 years, what would the, what would the benefits be? We were able to calculate those using a FEMA toolkit. The highway garage, we'd have around $209,000 worth of avoided damages. Uh, and at the town hall and the dog pound, about 200,000. Now, there's also benefits, open space benefits. If this wasn't a highway garage, if it was open space, it was a riparian area, it could be flooded without causing any damages, and people could use it when it's not being flooded for, for picnicking or walking around or fishing. Uh, there's additional benefits that kick in, and you can see those listed there, land use benefits. It's a big number. Yeah, I remember that's over a long period of time. There's additional benefits that we can't really quantify in our benefit cost analysis. There's a lot of materials that are sterile at the highway garage, and although they're legally and safely stored, in a flood, they're going to be problematic since the, the highway garage is very flood prone. So you can see here there's tires, there's parts cleaner and paints and that sort of thing. There's diesel tanks outside. This flood, this picture over here is not from uh, Shandaken. It was just to show an example of once that material gets into the creek. This is during Irene and Hunter, and, and you can see all the 55 <coughs> gallon drums and propane tanks that get it washed into the stream. And of course, it's a water supply watershed. So you don't want that to happen. So now I, I went through a lot of kind of analysis material here. Now I'm going to get into the, the recommendations. Uh, I'll go through those in sort of broad strokes. And as I said, they're, they're presented in a lot more detail in the report itself. So please look at that. So one of our first recommendations is that the town hall complex, that includes the dog pound, the highway garage, and the town hall, be relocated out of the special flood hazard area. We have a benefit cost analysis that supports it. 
it's a critical facility. The, the, the operations that go on in the town hall and, and the highway garage are very important to have uh, and be able to mobilize during a flood and after a flood, even the communications, the emergency services uh, that were very much disrupted after Irene. Uh, phone service was lost. There's a uh, police headquarters here. There's ambulances. And uh, so we recommend uh, that those be relocated. During the flood analysis, Phoenicia, Phoenicia and Mount Tremper, uh, that took place before this, there had been a parcel identified for, as a recipient parcel to this purpose. So we've identified that here. I know there are other funding sources and mechanisms underway to support that, that relocation uh, as well, which we, we outline in our flood analysis. Now, I went through the bridges in quite a bit of detail. I won't go through all the detail again, but at the Creekside Drive Bridge, as I said, we recommend a regular maintenance program there and potentially some removal of sediment if it starts to build up, and that any removal of sediment has to be done carefully to maintain the proper channel geometry is maintained so we don't make the problem worse. Uh, the Fox Hollow Bridge over Asopus Creek and the Town Owned Bridge, we, we recommend that if those bridges are damaged in the future or if they are scheduled for regular, regular uh, replacement, that they need to be upsized. And we need a full uh, hydraulic analysis that would typically take place when the bridge is being replaced so that they don't contribute to flooding and they don't overtop during floods. Uh, especially the Fox Hollow Bridge uh, is pretty critical for people who live up Fox Hollow to, to get out of that area. Um, so that bridge is important that it does not overtop and remains open. Of course, we're not going to be able to avoid flooding of all roads. There's going to continue to be uh, roads washing out and roads overtopping in floods. So we recommend a roadway closure plan. Uh, based on our hydraulic analysis, we're able to identify areas of town that are likely to overtop on a flood. We know where they've overtopped in the past, so we need to be out ahead of it when a flood is forecast, perhaps close roads and have detours and signs worked out and ready, um, as we say here. As I said, we tried a number of floodplain and channel enhancement projects. Now, as Rob said at the beginning, a number of these that we tried in Phoenicia and Mount Tremper, we actually recommended and are trying to go forward with some of those. Now that's a much more densely populated area. So when you construct a project, you can reduce flooding a bit. It doesn't eliminate flooding, but because it's reducing flooding in a business district with a lot of density of buildings, it becomes close to cost effective. In this area, the buildings are more spread out. So we tried a number of flood reduction alternatives by creating floodplain and we just didn't find any that really measurably reduced flooding enough that would make it cost effective. As I said at the levy, we, we, we do not recommend enhancing that levy, but we do recommend uh, armoring it to make sure it's, it's stable and does not continue to erode in a flood. Uh, as I said, it's not certified by FEMA and uh, it does not protect floods in the case of a 100-year flood. Uh, I explained at the beginning the difference between the 100-year the floodplain or the special flood hazard area and the floodway. Now, the floodway is the most dangerous area to be in a flood, and we recommend that where there's owner interest and there's uh, town interest and there's programmatic funding that uh, owners consider relocation out of the floodway. Uh, and also that the town enforce uh, and disallow any new development within the floodway, this most dangerous area, and also uh, disallow elevation of stru existing structures within the floodway. Now, for other areas within the special flood hazard area, but outside of the floodway, there's a number of of options that are available to residents. They could be voluntary buyouts uh, for frequently flooded homes and businesses. It could be individual flood proofing measures such as elevating a structure. Uh, for commercial buildings, I know they did it down at the, uh, what's the name of the bank there? The, the Key Bank, yeah. I, I, they toured me around there and you can see some innovative things they did there. Uh, even though the bank will continue to be flooded, 
there's ways that they're able to seal up the windows and doors and they're ensure that they can withstand the hydrostatic pressure. They have certain type of carpeting that can get flooded and then it's easily dried out and replaced and a number of other measures. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for flood proofing with commercial uh, buildings that aren't occupied uh, overnight or during a flood. Uh, it's a little more limited with residential structures. You've got to be very careful about, um, uh, you know, you can flood proof, but then if the, if the water surface elevations come up, it could cause hydrostatic pressure, could cause damage to the building and be very dangerous. Often what's encouraged for residential buildings is wet flood proofing, or as I said, elevating of, of appliances, elevating of electrical fixtures and that sort of thing. Uh, there's regulations for manufactured homes. Uh, they, they, they need to be elevated up above, two feet above the base flood elevation, just like a residential home. Uh, but in addition to that, they need to be, uh, you know, there's anchoring requirements and, and uh, structural requirements to make sure they're going to be safe, even if they're elevated in a flood and surrounded by floodwaters. And we, we have some detail in the report about the requirements for uh, manufactured homes. There are a number of uh, procedural recommendations here. I know the town is already doing a lot of these through their flood mitigation plan and they update it on a regular basis. It's so important when we do this sort of analysis to have good information available so we know what sort of damages occurred in the past, what sort of lost revenue for businesses. I know Aaron has collected a lot of that information and it was available to us which helps us a lot as we go through this. So that should continue to be collected uh, I list them briefly here, but in the report, there's quite a bit of, de of detail on funding sources for a lot of these recommendations that we're making. And we encourage the town and individuals to continue to pursue funding from some of these programs. There's uh, SMIP, which is a stream management implementation program. Uh, there's the New York City funded flood buyout program. Uh, a lot of different funding opportunities through Casco Watershed Corporation. Uh, and then a number of FEMA flood programs. And just to give one example here, say there was interest in elevating uh, a home. CWC has a program that would fund 75% of those costs of elevating uh, a structure to be above the base flood elevation. Now you may say to yourself, well that still leaves the homeowner with 25% of those costs, which could still be pretty substantial. But there may be a way to match funds. Like you may be able to get FEMA to fund that remaining 25%. And there's lots of those types of matching funds, which in some cases uh, would end up with the town or with individual homeowners uh, having to shoulder very little or none of the costs of some of these flood mitigation scenarios. Now, here's how you obtain the draft report. It's up on the Shandaken website. If you go there, there's a, a, flood, a flood section of the, of the town website. You can download the draft report. Uh, if, if there, through our conversation tonight, uh, if, I, if I make any changes as a result of comments tonight, and I know uh, Brent and Aaron have sent me a few minor changes that we still need to incorporate, and after that we'll finalize the report and get it back up on the, on the website so people can have it accessible. And we'll provide the town with a few hard copies once it's finalized. And I think that's about all I have to say, but I'll, uh, I'll take any questions or, or thoughts that people may have. And as I said, we've got the big maps up here and some smaller maps and other information on the individual properties. If anybody wants to come up and talk afterwards, Miguel and I could help you. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for your patience as I went through that. Thank you. Creek. That was their problem. And they sent their water over. 
over here. And it made Shandakin's flood problem much worse. Why do we allow that? It was shut down just before I did. It was, but it, they shut it down when the excavators were out here. Another, uh, no, it was shut down before I did. I don't think so. I know so. There's a certain level where it, it, they have to shut it down so long. Well, if you look back, they poured it on us. But anyway, wouldn't it help if the Shokan Reservoir could be dropped? Uh, the the Shokan Reservoir isn't a flood control reservoir. So uh, it, it's that's, it, the, that's the standard answer. Yeah. We're not in the flood control, we're in the water business. Well, no, every, no every, not, it's not, they're completely tight, different. You know, if you go up to the, the reservoirs up in the window, the flood control reservoirs, they're, other than a, a small conservation pool, they're empty. And they fill up in order to prevent flooding downstream. Now, you could get a little bit of flood attenuation at a Shokin Reservoir by drawing it down. Yes. And, and, but it would be downstream of a Shokin Reservoir. So it wouldn't affect us here. Um, and it would, be, it would be minimal. And we, we, uh, we ran a whole analysis because we did a, a flood analysis downstream of Squahari Reservoir. And we looked at, you know, if, it were, if we had this much freeboard, it makes a small difference. Uh, and it's... Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm no expert on Ashokan Reservoir because it doesn't influence this, this area. Um, but when you design and build a reservoir, you design it for water supply or you design it for flood mitigation, and they're very different types of reservoirs, they're very different types of dams, and they're operating.